This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 110. It's unusual nowadays to find design teams building one-off mock-ups of new digital products. Most modern design organizations use a design system that helps them follow well-established patterns, reuse code components, and create consistent user interfaces. To this point, the role of content has been an afterthought in many of these systems. Chris Straw sees that changing in the next few years and predicts that content will assume an important place in design systems. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number 110 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Chris Strahl. Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Knapsack, a design system software uh, platform, I guess we'd call it. Well, yeah. Welcome, Chris. Tell the folks more about yourself and uh, what you do there at, uh, at Knapsack. Yeah, so we founded Knapsack uh, a little over a year ago. Um, it came out of an agency that was focused on doing a lot of custom or, or DIY design systems for for big companies. And so uh, we'd been working in this space for uh, about three years, um, building design system platforms um, out of you know individual pieces, things like Storybook or Pattern Lab or um, Envision tools, and and mixing them together into these custom workspaces. And we saw a need in the market that was pretty exciting for us. And so uh, we built a SaaS platform to kind of create this common workspace for design and engineering to collaborate around building patterns. Nice. And that kind of, the way you just said that, it's a perfect explanation of a design system. But a lot of my, you know, the, I don't know this exactly, but my, my audience is content strategists. And I think there's there's probably a lot of people who are super familiar, probably as familiar as you and I with design systems, but I have a lot of folks who aren't. So could you just kind of walk through like what a design system is, sort of the origin story of the of the system? Because it's a fairly new idea. Yeah, uh, uh, it's actually kind of like a new implementation of an old idea, which, you know, is is pretty common for, for the technology space. Um, a lot of this started with physical design way back in the day. This guy, Christopher Alexander, looked at patterns in architecture and in, in the physical world and understood that uh, most homes and buildings were built out of the same, you know, 200-ish patterns, I think. Um, things like windows, doors, sinks, bathrooms, living rooms, roofs, uh, that sort of stuff. And, you know, this, this got applied in the web context in a lot of the early days of the internet, um, you know, with, with site building tools and, and the original no code platforms like, like Dreamweaver and stuff like that used to have a bunch of kind of pattern like concepts in them. Um, but really a lot of that, that was very difficult to do because, um, you know, modern design systems sort of necessitate you to, to be a craftsperson while also at the same time, um, understanding that that pages are constructed of component parts and it was really brad frost's book about atomic design that kind of solidified that as a, a epic in the the modern world of of web design um we kind of think about a design system is broken into four parts we think about it as, as a design asset library so that's like all of your your um figma files or sketch files or or xd files that are organized around modular encapsulated bits of UI, cards, buttons, heroes, navs, those sorts of things. Um, then you have your component library, which is, is more on the engineering side, which is the representation of that code as, as rendered HTML or CSS, or if you're using a native app, um, whatever native app platform you're using. Um, and that represents those modular encapsulated bits of UI that exist independent of their content um, or their business logic. And then there's, there's the documentation about these things. So like, you know, where do these come from? What's the intent of them? How do you use them? What are the right variations to think about in the right context? All the other bits about um, sort of the service model attached to, to the design system. And then last but not least, there's actually how you consume it, the, the delivery of the code. Um, you know, we're really fond at Knapsack of saying that, that um, you know, a lot of the, the design tools are really great for original creation, but ultimately users don't look at Figma files when they go and use a website. They look at code um, interpreted by a web browser. So you need some way of getting that code into the production applications that ultimately consume the design system. Right. So it's a, it's a way to um, organize all of this stuff because this has been going on for years, but it's just better articulated, it sounds like now, and better better managed um, in how it's all how it all comes together. 
Yeah, and it's also enabled by a lot of sort of modern movements in the web. Um, the idea of using JSON and schema definitions to define, um, you know, variants and props and children and slots and all these other sorts of things that exist inside of, of modern web frameworks. Um, and really, JavaScript also helped enable that. Can't forget the rise of things like React. Um, and uh, I think there's also a lot with with the decoupling um, of, of content and display. Uh, you know, you used to always have these huge monolithic CMSs. Um, you know, I, I used to work a lot in Drupal, and Drupal was predominantly a monolith. Even though in the the later time when I was I was working there, we were constantly trying to tease that apart into being more like a content service than an actual content management platform. Um, and so, having the idea that that UI should be distinct and independent from the content you put inside of it, and the business logic that ultimately impacts that that content or that UI's behavior. Yep. Yeah. And that's sort of, that's where it really gets into like my, my, my audience's interests, I think, is that <clears throat> that overlap or intersection of the content management systems and design systems. Um, how, you mentioned like for, you mentioned a couple minutes ago, the four main component the parts of a design system. You see one of them is documentation. So there's the documentation of the design system itself, but then there's also the content, the strings and other content associated with the, the digital products themselves. Tell me about, you know, from your perspective as an old school content person and watching this evolution, how do you see that all unfolding now? I mean, there's, there's some really obvious places where things are helpful. Um, you know, the ability to take things like, like strings that you would see in an application, the, the text of buttons, um, you know, headers, navigation, um, those sorts of things, and, and make those actual um, components in a design system that have different options. And, and you could see like lots of really cool things for translation and localization attached to that kind of work. Um, likewise, uh, legal teams and the ability to control legal language inside of, of uh, a, a design system is a really powerful thing. But really, all this relates back to to what is the most empathetic way to build a system that people are actually going to be able to adopt and understand. Um, design systems are unique in the idea that they're products that serve other products. And so very often, the people that are building the design system are not the people that are actually implementing the design system or consuming it in an end product. And so the ability to create uh, uh, content, which really is, is predominantly sample data um, that exists within the design system that best mirrors what it will look like in production is really an empathetic thing to do. Um, if you think about it, the, the creators of a design system, their users are usually other people inside of their organization that then have to consume their product. And so the closer that they're able to make that look and feel like um, the end product, oftentimes through through image assets or, or other bits of content, uh, the better off they're going to be. Right. So especially, I think I'm thinking of like sites with a lot of user generated content, that would be a real interesting problem because, <clears throat> or not problem, but an issue because you have so much content to work with. But in other places, you just have sort of... Um, I mean, at some places you might be working with the actual content that would display in the interface. Can you talk about that spectrum a little bit from bespoke to completely? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at like a really cool system, um, which we've built a, a couple of times with, with Knapsack is this idea of how do I connect my, my component library and my design asset library to like a RESTful API that is pulling in content from, from some external system and populating your design system with real true production content, be that like UGC or be that some sort of, you know, curated asset management system. Um, you know, this is really enabled by, by applications like Contentful where it's content as a service in, in a real sense and you're able to sort of slice and dice and pull that content um, as JSON very easily into um, a design system context. Um, that, that's like one end, right? Where you're getting your actual production content in your design system and all the things like dynamic data and, and all that all show up the way that you would expect them to. And so that, that in that case is sample content that is extremely close to production content. Um, and then there's sort of the other end of that, that spectrum, which would, I guess, be like Lorem, right? Um, and, and I think that, that uh, you know, Lorem and Unsplash gets you at least an illustration of, of the right direction. But, you know, if you think about the purpose here, it's about expressing intent. And um, the best expression of intent is what's actually closest to the reality a user will experience.
Right. And that, and, and it sounds like design, how does that work with the design system? Like when you're working with clients, like, and not, um, and I, I know knapsack is almost like not, if not unique, one of the first, uh, entries in this. So I'm just, I don't know that there are standards in the, in this kind of software industry yet about how you do that, but talk a little bit about how you would work with, you know, a client at either end of that spectrum. Right. So I guess for, for people that have a much more um, you know, mature way of thinking about how content works in their design system, those people tend to also have, like, by nature, much more mature design systems. And so they usually have thought about a design system as being something more than a library of components. Um, they've thought about the um, contribution model. They've thought about the decision-making model. They've thought about the workflow that things need to go through to get into the design system. Um, how that design system has changed and how those changes roll out to to production applications. Um, and so very often for us in Knapsack, that's um, that's a, a much easier sort of implementation, right? We're, we're mostly spending our time um, wiring things up, connecting to, to the right code repos, connecting to the right uh, design libraries, and connecting to the right content services. Um, on the other side of things, very often those people are, are just getting started with a design system or um, don't have a lot of experience with, with what design systems are. Almost everybody these days has something, right? Somebody has some components somewhere, um, and somebody has like a, a well-structured uh, design file or artboard somewhere. Um, but oftentimes they need a lot of help connecting those things. And I think, unfortunately, content tends to be at the, the bottom of the stack in terms of, of priority for that stuff. Uh, people are so eager to get their design and code into the same place that thinking about that that empathetic content is um, oftentimes tertiary. Hmm. Um, the only other thing I think is interesting there is in cases like that, we tend to have a very different starting point. Um, we tend to start with principles and we start to think about the content of the design system itself. Why do you have a design system? Why do you use it? What is its purpose? How is this intended to foster collaboration and trust through your team? What are the principles that this design system will achieve if it's a successful product inside of your organization? And that kind of content has its own, um, its own needs, its own strategy, and its own kind of purpose in fulfilling the design system's promise. I'm guessing from this last couple of minutes, you're just talking that that like the more mature organizations, that principles articulation is just almost pro forma, just like fill in the blanks kind of thing. But whereas a less mature organization, do you have to do a lot of handholding and extraction of those principles or helping them articulate them? Yeah, certainly. And so, you know, you think about the the pioneers in our industry, right? Like things like like Google Material and Lightning and all of these other design systems that are out there, IBM's Carbon, that are, are these well-established things. They've had a lot of time to spend thinking about and refining their content and a lot of organizational muscle memory attached to how you think about building with design systems. I mean, design systems aren't just like, like here's a little tweak to your process. It's, it's very similar to going from like waterfall to agile um, is how mm -hmm. we describe it, right? Where it's a very different way about thinking about how you build an application. Instead of saying like, all right, let's get a list of requirements and start making comps. It's like, let's look at the patterns that we have and see how the patterns that we have fulfill these user needs that we've identified. Um, and you start with your patterns before you ever start thinking about what you create that's original. And I would love to see that extension in the content sphere someday of, of like, hey, we have all this wonderful content that represents these needs for users. What are ways that we can take that content and similarly think about the patterns inside of our content before we think about how we create something new? Have you seen examples of that yet? Or you, you clearly have thoughts about it. Um, tell me more about how we can, you know, identify and use those, those content patterns. Yeah, I think a lot of this has to do with personalization. And that's probably where we've seen it the most, right? Um, you know, websites are trying to get more personal with the way they interact with users. Um, trying to think about, you know, the content that is meaningful to a user within a context. Um, so if you think about like a, a healthcare um, application, uh, you want to know probably about the things that you've been diagnosed with or the bills for the services that you've been rendered or the um, information about the physician that you've chosen or the, the medical procedure or medical office that you need to go to. Um, all those represent opportunities for, for personalization of content inside of a system that would be a healthcare application. 
all of those also have structured data behind them. Uh, you know, you have structured data about the content of a physician, a procedure, a diagnosis, uh, a bill, all of those things that ultimately can can maintain and build a similar structure to how we think about a, a component in a system or a piece of UI. Um, there is probably some, you know, three plus year convergence horizon where you start to see those systems rally around that same structured data. And it probably starts with the ability to pull in uh, personalized content based on the context of a UI. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, and I know, uh, I know that there are some forward thinking uh, like content agencies who are doing stuff around that now and, and, and enterprises, enterprises doing that kind of thing now. Um, and this three year convergence that you see coming is that because in those cases, I always, those almost always come down to like <clears throat> aligning per the purpose of the content with the intent of the user and kind of meshing those in some way. Um, is there, and I can, and, th and that's more like kind of in the actual delivery of the content, but you're talking, we're, we're back up a couple levels uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the design. Tell me how that manifests in a design system. Well, it is all about the structure of the data, right? Um, I think that, that the only place that you really see that sort of data structure really commonly, and I'm, I'm sure your listeners are going to just be like groaning at this, is within like digital asset management, right? Images have a lot of metadata attached to them. Audio files, video files have a lot of metadata attached to them. And all of that structural data helps you understand the patterns that reside within that data and how you might actually want to present those to users in a similar way, right? Like this is all about patterns. And and what is a pattern fundamentally? It's a, a reasonable solution to a commonly recurring problem. Um, and so if you have a commonly recurring user need for a particular type or kind of content, you can use that structured data to, to infer what content might be valuable to a user. Um, and so that is, is a type of content pattern um, that you could see what form it takes or what medium it takes um, you know, I still think that's, that's very much TBD. Um, but the data that has the most structure is the one that fits best within the context of, of a pattern system. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of this is now reminding you used the word, uh, decoupled a couple times earlier. And a lot of this seems to be about the recoupling of whether it's like pretty high level conceptual stuff. Some of this really makes my brain hurt sometimes. Um, but because especially when you get to this sort of pattern level rather than individual instance level. Um, but is that a concept that's always kind of at the forefront in here, that notion of decoupledness and stitching things back together? Yeah, I always kind of think about it potentially in an oversimplified system where you think about like a three-legged stool that, that is an application, right? You have the, the business logic, the, the back-end logic of an app, you have the content, and then you have the front end, right? The UI. And so between those three things, you, you glue those together in some some form and, and you have a, a digital application. Um, for a long time, we've had microservices. Microservices predominantly represent backend things. I need to charge somebody's credit card. I need to go retrieve their their billing amount from a billing system. I need to go um, perform this this mathematical operation uh, to find out what their loan payment is. Um, those are predominantly service based things. Content has has been moving in that direction for yeah you know, decade or so, right? Like this idea of of I don't want this monolith where everything is tied together. I want my content as a service and I want structured data get to give me back content that is is relevant to the concept or sorry, the 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 API call that I'm making. Um and I mean there's there's entire companies uh built around that. I mentioned Contentful earlier. There's a bunch of digital asset management companies that also do very similar things. Um what we've never had before is that sort of of ability inside of front end, right? Um and this starts to get into to kind of woo-woo land, right? Of like, like front end as a service. Uh, but that's kind of what design systems are driving at, right? This idea of, of structured data defines your UI and you're able to use your, your you're able to use an API to retrieve uh, variants of UI based upon, um, you know, what you want out of that, that API call. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is a decoupling, recoupling, but it's not a monolith anymore. It's a, a set of interconnected services. And I think that's a really important difference because now you can evolve each of them independently instead of having to to wait for the next uh, you know version of WordPress or Drupal or Sitecore or whatever. Um, you have the ability to advance your content discipline independent of your business logic and independent of your UI. 
Right. That's, I mean, that's the whole, um, yeah, like you said, the last 10 years or so, the evolution of content um, <clears throat> to be increasingly decoupled and, and the rise of headless CMSs and, and whole new uh, like content platforms that. Yeah. I mean, look at, really, look at the power of Gatsby and sanity and Netlify and all these things that are out there now. Right. Like yeah. people eat that up because it's suddenly something that, um, you know, you're not, you're not blocked on on a back end developer or a, a UI developer or whatever to start to put your content in a system, and that content can evolve and change independent of how far along the site design is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's and I think you are just articulate what some people call the jam stack, the that that decoupled um, as opposed to I, I think of this as like the difference between content as publication and content as a service where you're serving instead of serving up templates, you're serving up API endpoints to, mm -hmm. to grab content from. And, and so you're, and that changes your audience though too, because instead of serving, it's, it decouples you from that end user in the sense that you're really designing APIs so the developers can get what they need to, to like you just said, have that, that um, uh, front end as a service model. Yeah. yeah, people are realizing that web pages aren't posters that you can grab the corner of and resize, right? They're 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 in a medium and in a, a format that is fundamentally different than anything else that we have. And so a lot of these ideas that we took from print about like publication or about like how a, a website is just a magazine and each page is a different uh, you know, part of that magazine, all of those systems are starting to break down. That that point of view is starting to become um, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but like uh, substantially less emphasized than the model of, you know, you have a store of data, that data has structure to it, and that data has meaning in a context. And it's all about how you take that intent, that context, and that meaning, and you stick those things together. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a much more powerful sort of way of thinking about the web as a new medium than what we've really been thinking about before. And this is happening in design too, right? Like we're not, we're not seeing page comps anymore. You're seeing, you're seeing component comps or uh, uh, even better, you're seeing fewer comps at all. You're seeing a lot of original creation happen in, in design tools, but you're not seeing people uh, making giant sticker sheets of buttons. There's a lot of people that went to, to a very expensive art school for a very long period of time and their job is essentially production inside of, of a big enterprise. And moving away from that production mindset into the mindset of like, let's all define systems and rules and structure data together that we can leverage so that nobody ever has to make another button or another hero or another card. Um, you know, I, I assume in the content space, that's like nobody wants to ever have to realize that like it's, it's okay or confirm or cancel anymore that goes into those buttons. Yep. No, the way you just described that too, it's like, that's the, we haven't really talked about the benefits of a design system, but you just articulated one of the main ones, which is that it frees you up from those tedious production tasks to do more creative work. And that's going to apply equally to designers and content designers, I'm going to guess. Yeah. I mean, get things in the medium that they're destined for. Um, design tools are great. You need some place where you can start with a blank canvas and you can, you can click on one, one part of that canvas and draw a box. Um, cause you can't do that in code yet. That, that doesn't exist in VS code and for good reason. But once you actually have the initial concepts and the rules and the ideas of, of what that design intent should be, those should be expressed as code. Um, and then get that into that code medium because that's ultimately what a user sees in a browser. And I think likewise in content, right? Whether you're, you're doing something in Microsoft word or contentful, it doesn't really matter as long as you're able to get it into a production site and actually see it in the medium it's destined for much, much earlier in the process. Um, and that's where this convergence is really happening, right? Is, is the idea that getting things into the right medium more quickly in the process is what people want because it represents the reality of what a user consumes. Yep. You know, and that's, but there's a difference between what you're saying and WYSIWYG, right? Sure. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that like, you know, WYSIWYG in, in the web is, um, um, you know, thankfully also starting to be one of those things that, that we don't talk as much about. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, how many breakpoints at what widths at what fluid media query does what is, you know, something that people are realizing that the, the web is a very fluid thing and very dynamic in how it displays things. And you cannot possibly account for all devices and screen widths and configurations of, of people's systems say nothing about assistive technology. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the web as a much more fluid thing than, than, 
a poster where you're you're dragging blocks onto a screen and typing text. Um, you know, you need to think about all those edge cases, and that's where a lot of the the details are in the way that we produce the modern web. Mm -hmm. And as you say that, you're reminding me that like one of the challenges that comes up all the time as as just as content practice advances is <clears throat> bringing so many content creators in the in the content authors are used to that old linear WYSIWYG model and creating content for these new decoupled systems is is different. And I'm just wondering how design systems can help with that transition for folks. Yeah, I think one of my favorite content examples is when you think about like a, a card and you have a headline under an image and a card. And that looks really good with uh, a single English word in it that's not particularly long, maybe a dozen characters, 20 at the most. And then all of a sudden somebody localizes it to German. And instead of 20 characters, that word is 45 characters. And now all of a sudden you're either overflowing your card or you're creating this weird mid-word wrap inside of your, your headline text under your image. Now that's a design problem, but that's also a content problem. And ultimately it, both of those things converge into a code problem. And so where a design system really helps you with that is the ability to understand before you ever end up in a production environment where you're then like sending to some poor team in Germany to localize, you can basically say like, I understand that if I'm creating a, a headline that exceeds some particular width that I want to actually reduce the size of that headline so that it all fits in one space. Um, and that's a very good example, I think, of like a multifaceted problem that impacts content, it impacts design, and ultimately it impacts the way that you engineer that card component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that it's also the kind of thing that's um, not trivially easy, but, but quite easy to do in a design system to say like, oh, and, and you could even have like, okay, what's my edge case localization scenario and just show me that. And I'm like, th then you deal with it in, then rather than like you said, when you get to production. Right. And like I'm cherry picking a small example. Right. But I, I think that 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 applies in a broadly complex scenario too. Uh, something like like right to left or um, something like an aesthetic that, that works in in um, uh, China or Japan uh, versus an aesthetic that works in in uh, Mexico or Latin America. Um, you know, those the just the concepts of spacing there are, are vastly different, uh, let alone the, the way that people actually look at content. Um, and so, you know, localization is, is a huge opportunity for the value of design systems to shine through, both in terms of design itself, as well as the content you put in the system. Yeah, gotcha. Hey, Chris, I can't believe it. We're already coming up close to time. Um, and I could always talk forever. But but any, I want to make sure before we wrap up, is there anything last, anything that's come up in the conversation or that's just on your mind that you want to make sure we share? So I, I think one of the things that is really interesting is sort of this, uh, like, what is a modern CMS question, right? Like we joke all the time at, at Knapsack, like, wow, we're like, you know, one step away from a new kind of CMS. Um, because if you're able to take the, the um, you know, uh, endpoint renderings of HTML and CSS in a design system that have a bunch of simple content in them, now all of a sudden you have HTML and CSS with content in them that is viewable as a web page. Like, you know, that's it's very nearly a production thing, right? You just need some, some server to stick that on and you could serve that page. Um, so I, I do think that there is a future here where people are actually building with design systems um, and thinking about... Uh, uh, the rules and structure and intent of content as a part of that building process um, and perhaps even, even backend development. Um, and so, you know, it sort of remains to be seen, but there's an interesting, at least academic exercise of is the next iteration of a CMS really about patterns. Um, and, and if it is a pattern driven system, how do we think about building content design code and services that fit within that pattern framework yeah that's a super interesting future to contemplate i can't wait to i'll definitely be following you to watch this unfold because i assume is your intent to lead the way on that yeah i mean we'll see right like uh uh i think one of the wonderful things about a startup company right is you get to you get to do a lot of experiments because you're trying to find out what what works and what people gravitate towards um while at the same time um, getting people to, to see the vision of, of your future state. 
right now our future is design systems, but the really interesting stuff comes after a design system is, is broadly adopted. Um, you know, things like analytics and, and data and the ability to use that data to help you make decisions about design or, or code. Um, you know, there's a huge wide open field here that is this step change in the way that we think about building the web. And uh, I think design systems are a really great next step in that. Nice. Well, I'm excited to watch how all this unfolds. Well, well, thanks so much, Chris. Oh, one very last thing. What's the best way for folks to stay in touch? Do you have a social media account or? Yeah, you can track me down on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, slash in slash Chris Strahl and then uh, at Chris Strahl on Twitter. Um, always love to get comments. Um, and then, of course, you can also listen to our podcast about design systems at the Design Systems Podcast. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll link to all that stuff in, in the show notes as well. Well, thanks so much, Chris. Really enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. Hey, Larry, really appreciate you having me on. Uh, wonderful show. And uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Likewise. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.